Hello? Can everybody hear me? OK, cool. Hi, everybody. I'm Christy Wilson. I'm a software engineer at Google, and I work on the Container Tools team. I've worked in a lot of different industries. I've worked in mobile, uh, foreign currency exchange, AAA games. Uh, this talk is based on my work most recently with conformance testing for Knative serving and also from leading the Knative pipeline project. I'm very passionate about software quality. I've worked on a lot of projects where quality was sacrificed for speed and the technical debt accumulated until the project became very hard to work on and almost impossible to change. One of the places where people often make sacrifices is in testing. So what we're going to talk about today is how pyramids and shells can help us make well-tested CRD-based platforms. You'll get the most out of this talk if you have worked on your own custom controllers before. All of our examples are going to be in Go, and we're going to be looking at two approaches, which is either starting from the Kubernetes sample controller and using client Go, or using KubeBuilder. But even if you haven't worked with CRDs before, you still might find some of this content interesting. So here's a quick intro to what they are. CRD stands for Custom Resource Definition. So this is something that lets us add our own types to Kubernetes in addition to the built-in ones like deployments and pods. On their own, CRDs just let us create structured data. But we want to operate on that data, so we add controllers, which are binaries that we run. And together, we can make declarative APIs. Controllers are binaries that operate on your CRDs when they change state, so when they're created or updated or deleted. So why would you be making your own CRD-based system? It's usually because you're creating a platform. A platform is software that we build other software on top of. And usually, the point of the platform isn't the platform itself. It's the things that we want to build on top of it. That's where the real business value is. A platform is an abstraction of all the stuff that you have to do to get your software running. This means that platforms are the foundation for the important business value that we actually want to build. This puts a lot of pressure on us as platform developers, because if we don't build this foundation correctly, then our users are going to have a very hard time and they won't use our platforms. This means platforms should be our best tested software. So if we're going to make CRD-based platforms, how do we test them? You may have seen this pyramid before. This is the classic testing pyramid. This tells us the kinds of tests that we should be writing and how many we should be writing of each type. We start with unit tests, which are our cheapest and fastest tests, and we, wrote, we write mostly unit tests and a little bit of the other kind, which, as we move up the pyramid, become slower and more expensive. Specifically for CRDs, we're going to be talking about this pyramid. It's pretty much the same pyramid, but we're using slightly different terms to refer to the types of tests. In this talk, we're going to go through each type and talk about how you can write it and what Go libraries you can use and what tricks are available. Let's start at the top of the pyramid with end-to-end -end tests. The key characteristic of these tests is that we will be connecting to an actual Kubernetes cluster. As you can see from the top of the pyramid, the box is the smallest, so this means we should be writing the fewest number of these tests. We don't necessarily want to get coverage here. What we want is to make sure that we've actually integrated everything properly and it all works together. So in order to run these tests, we need a Kubernetes cluster, and it has to be running your controllers. You could deploy your controllers as part of your test setup, but I recommend that you offload that to a tool that's specifically for deployment. For example, something like Co. Most of these tools are pretty easy to call before you invoke your tests, so I recommend doing that. That way you can iterate on the tests themselves more quickly. So from this point forward, we're going to assume that you have a Kubernetes cluster and your controllers are running in it. Let's look at seven specific things that you can do to get your end-to-end -end tests up and running. Also, the code samples that I'm going to be showing you here are available in the GitHub repo at the bottom of the slide if you want to take a look later. If you use these seven things, it's actually pretty easy to get your end-to-end -end tests up and running. 
So the first thing that I recommend is about how your tests are invoked. As you start adding these tests, you'll notice that when you run go test, it runs all of your tests. And since end-to-end -end tests have to connect to a cluster and they're slower, that can be frustrating. So I recommend using go build tags. In this example, we use the tag E to E to identify the tests that we don't want to run by default. Then when we run go test, those tests won't be compiled and they won't be run. But when we do want to run them, we just specify the tag and we can run them in isolation. The next recommendation is to declare your test inputs in Go instead of YAML. YAML is definitely more readable and it makes sense to provide it as examples for your users, but your tests will probably need to manipulate your CRDs and change some fields like, for example, the namespace. And in order for them to do that with the YAML version, you have to load the YAML and parse it and it becomes messy and it's kind of hard to understand what the actual test input is. So I recommend just declaring it in Go. Once you declare these objects, what can you do with them? Well, we need a client that can connect to your Kubernetes cluster. And the way that we get that client is slightly different depending on how you built your controller. And what do I mean when I talk about how you build your controller? Well, there's two approaches you could have used. So the first one is if you went to the Kubernetes sample controller and built your controller from that, that meant that you probably had to copy and paste a bunch of boilerplate, and then there's a script that you have to rerun periodically to generate your libraries. Alternatively, you may have used KubeBuilder, which also uses client Go under the covers, but it creates libraries for you dynamically so you don't have to statically generate them, and there's less boilerplate involved. Whichever approach you use, I recommend telling your tests how to connect to your cluster using your kubeconfig. Your kubeconfig file already has your endpoint information and it says how to authenticate with the cluster. And if you want to invoke the test locally, you can just use the one you already have. And if you want to run them on CI, you can provide a static kubeconfig file. So the first thing you need to do in your tests is take the path to your kubeconfig and instantiate a config object. And then from there, the way you instantiate your clients is slightly different depending on which library you're using, but it's still only a couple lines of code. I mentioned at the beginning of the talk that we use CRDs to create declarative APIs. This means that our APIs are eventually consistent which means that operations that we make are asynchronous. So just because we made a create call and it returned, that doesn't mean the resource was actually created. So this means our tests need to do a certain amount of polling to wait for the system to actually realize the state that we declared. And I find the poll functions in the API machinery library really helpful for this. I use this poll immediate function all the time. This is an example of it in action where it's wrapped in a function called wait for pod state, which is called by our test. The interface here is that we provide a function which is called immediately, and it continues to be called every time interval passes until either it returns true or it times out. Now, if you're doing all of this polling, it means your tests might hang for, but might look like they're hanging because they're not doing anything. So I recommend regularly outputting information about what your test is doing. So before you're going to do something that takes a while, log a statement explaining what's happening. It's important to note, though, that if you use the log functions in the testing library, your output will be buffered. This means that you won't be able to see it until the test completes, which defeats the purpose. So use an unbuffered library. Even better, if you use a named library, it makes it so that you can run these tests in parallel because the log output will be interleaved, but you can actually see which test each line came from. This next one is something that I learned the hard way because I didn't do it for a long time. This is to create a namespace for every test. If you try to share namespaces between tests, your tests can interfere with each other, and it takes a long time to properly clean up an entire namespace. However, it turns out to be pretty easy and lightweight to just create a namespace at the beginning of your test and tear it down at the end. And speaking of teardowns, you should be aware that when your test is done, it's not enough to just defer the teardown, you should also catch the interrupt signal because these tests take a long time to run and it's pretty common that you'll be running them and you'll have to interrupt them or possibly your CI system will need to interrupt it and you want the, the cleanup to happen in that case as well. 
OK, so let's say that we wrote our system test. Where do we go from here? As we move down the pyramid, we get to integration tests. It's really hard to define integration tests. But it's fair to say that they're somewhere between end-to-end -end tests and unit tests. They're not unit tests because they put pieces of the system together. And they aren't end-to-end -end tests because they don't use the whole system. The way that we write integration tests for our CRDs depends, again, on how we built our controllers. Each of them has different approaches, and you're kind of stuck with one or the other, depending on how you built the controller, but they still have different strengths. Well, let's start with looking at the Kube builder based integration tests. If you use Kube builder to initialize your project, it actually generates integration tests for you. You still have to fill in all the assertions, but it creates all the setup and the teardown. And what these do for you is they run processes for you locally. They start an instance of each of your controllers, they start an instance of the API server, and they start an etcd instance. This is an example of what some of the gener generated code looks like. If this looks kind of unfamiliar to you, that's because it's using a testing library for BDD called Ginkgo. But what's happening in this code is that we're first creating an instance of our CRD, which is of type feline, and then we're waiting for the controller to create a corresponding deployment. And the cool thing is we can do this without actually requiring a Kubernetes cluster. But because there's no Kubernetes cluster, we're a little bit limited in what we can test. So you can pretty much assert on any state that you expect to be created, but you can't expect something like your containers to actually run and to hit an endpoint. You'd have to do that in the end-to-end -end test. If you use client go, you have some options too. These options use something called the test double. This term refers to any pretend object that you use that pretends to be some other object in your system. You may be familiar with mocks, fakes, and stubs. Client Go will provide you with a fake Kubernetes client, and it also generates fake clients for you for each of your controllers. And the cool thing about these is that you can reach inside of them and tell them what objects you expect to exist in the world. Instantiating them is very easy. This is how you do it. And then you use this to instantiate your controller. The cool part comes in when you seed data into the clients. So this is an example of seeding the informer inside of my fake client with an object. And what this does is later on, if any code tries to retrieve objects, it's going to get the one that we seeded. This starts to look a little bit more verbose when we have more complicated scenarios. This is the code from the pipeline CRD project that we use to instantiate our controller. It has to instantiate six different types of CRDs. It puts them into the clients, and it puts them into the informer's cache. The other thing that you can do with these objects is you can use them as mocks. So you can assert on the methods that were called. So in this case, we're making sure that the list function was called. If you're used to unit testing, you might be wondering why I'm referring to these as integration tests, since they use test doubles. There are a few reasons for this. One is, if you're testing at the level of your controller, the inputs and outputs that you have to deal with are actually pretty similar to what you're dealing with in the end-to-end -end test case. Also, you aren't isolating the code that you're testing. You're testing the controller as a whole. And lastly, you still are combining pieces of the system together. You're just faking out the data. As far as which approach to use, again, you're kind of stuck with the one that comes with the system that you used but there are different advantages. The advantage of the Kube Builder approach is that you can run the actual processes. This is about as close as you can come to an end-to-end -end test scenario, but you can do it all without a Kubernetes cluster. And the advantage of the Client Go approach is that it's much easier to seed data. This brings us to the bottom of the pyramid, the unit tests. So this is where we want to have the most coverage. We should have mostly unit tests with just a smattering of the other types. And, the re and there's some, some, there are several reasons for that. One reason is because they are cheap and they are fast. But there's something else besides that. This is because all the types of tests that we've been talking about up until this point integrate multiple components together. Why is that bad? 
Well, some of the disadvantages of these tests are that they're slow and they're expensive, which we already talked about, but there's another big reason. It's because they promote bad design. To understand why that is, we have to look at what good design is. Good design is something that we often refer to as testable code. But the thing is, we don't write code to be testable just because we want to test it. We write testable code because it has these attributes. It's loosely coupled, it's highly cohesive, and the interfaces are well-defined. Integrated tests, however, hide all of these design problems. For example, you can't see the details here, but this is a reconcile loop. Even just glancing at it, you can see that it's very long. It is not highly cohesive. It does a lot of different things. It's not loosely coupled. It calls into a lot of different objects. But integrated tests don't care. You can still write an integration test for this just fine. Unit testing this, however, is really difficult. As soon as you started trying to write the unit test for this, you would realize something was wrong. The fact that it's really hard to write a unit test for this is a signal that you should revisit your design because there's something wrong with it. Using lots of unit tests encourages us to design our software well. So how do we do this specifically for CRDs? I recommend that you follow the functional core and imperative shell approach. The idea is that your business logic is in something called the functional core, and then all the messy stuff that communicates with the outside world is in the imperative shell, which calls into the functional core. Now, when I say functional here, I'm not recommending that you go and rewrite all of your code to be purely functional, or, or that you start using monads. I mean specifically that you can write code that avoids mutating state, that doesn't do any I.O., and doesn't have any side effects. So that's what I mean when I talk about the functional core. You still need the other stuff, but you isolate it in this imperative shell. Another way to look at this is to follow this advice from Dave Cheney. So if we factor our code really well, and we have highly focused packages, then we separate the code that provides functionality, or the functional core, from the code that consumes it, or the imperative shell. When, when we talk about this for CRDs, this means specifically to avoid adding stuff to your reconcile loop. The reconcile loop being exactly, if you're using client go, I'm talking about the sync handler function. If you're using code builder, I'm talking about the reconcile function. So as much as possible, we want to avoid putting our core business logic in there, and we want to avoid adding more functions onto our controllers. What we want to do is treat the controller and all of its related objects as the imperative shell. It's the glue that holds our controllers together. So we want to keep that isolated from the business logic, which we can put in these really well-factored functions. And these well-factored functions can actually be unit tested without requiring any test doubles at all. Specifically, the way to do this is to avoid passing around listers and informers. If you find yourself doing that, try to rewrite the functions you're writing instead so that they just take exactly the objects they need to operate on. This separates the concern of retrieving the objects from what you actually want to do with them. Testing is super important for platforms and for CRD-based platforms. And it turns out that we already have all of the tools that we need to test them really well. So, when you're writing your CRD-based platforms, remember the pyramid. Write tests of all of these kinds, but focus on the unit tests. Because the unit tests will push us to design our code well and isolate the functional core. So what can you do to make this happen? There's two things. The first thing is to measure your coverage and see where you're at. The second thing is to take a look at your reconcile loop. So go to your project and run go test with the cover flag and see where you're at. You shouldn't aim for 100% coverage because that's not worth the effort, but about 80% is pretty good. And then take a look at your reconcile loop. How much logic have you implemented directly in there? And how many functions have you added onto your controller? If you can refactor those out, then you can increase your coverage pretty easily. So remember the pyramid and the shell, and we can write stable, reliable, maintainable CRD-based platforms. Thank you. <laughs>
Uh, and I have some sources in here too. The slides are online if you want to look at all of these other great uh, presentations and articles. Um, does anybody have any questions? We have a microphone or, no, uh, oh, it's coming. I think it's coming. Uh, it's a microphone. All right. Um, I was wondering if you could talk about, we, we actually have a, quite a few um, conversations at, at, at my own firm about how, what the right level of code coverage is. And I noticed there you put that magic 80% number. Mm -hmm. I'm just curious, because I know it's, there's a degree to which it's a finger in the wind, mm -hmm. but uh, how, how did you reach that? Because we, we, we also came to the conclusion that 100% is kind of like not efficient, not realistic. But mm -hmm. where, where is the sweet spot? Why is 80, why 80%? I think that 80% uh, is mostly an arbitrary number. Um, but from all the projects that I've worked on, it, the ones that are the best tested usually end up being around 80%. And I think if you follow the recommendation where you have all of your business logic and these really well-factored functions and you have like the ugly glue stuff outside, then what ends up happening is that you provide coverage for the, for the, the business logic in those functions and then like don't really worry so much about the ugly glue. And I think that the trade-off in like how much code you have that's ugly glue is like 20%. It's like 20% gluing everything together and 80% the actual thing you're trying to do. But it's pretty arbitrary. Like if you're at like 69% and you look at your code and there's like it's all the stuff that's not covered, I think it's important to know what you're covering and what you're not. If the stuff you're not covering is this like weird glue, then like it's probably fine. Uh, okay, so, so it's mainly from, from your own empirical observations that you find that's a sweet spot. Yeah. Okay, okay. So on your point about using, avoiding YAML and instead using deeply nested constructs, something I have seen in Kubernetes uh, test, uh, tests is they often have those littered directly in the test bodies. Mm -hmm. So to read what a single test is doing can span 100 to 500 lines. It feels like at some point you want to refactor those into fixtures I've also seen some other tests that use something akin to a builder pattern. I was curious, in the same sort of feeling it out uh, way, what, what do you look for in terms of when it's time to pull things up into fixtures and what patterns or practices would you recommend? Um, so I think the only recommendation that I have there is the one about um, the, the, the wrong abstraction is worse than duplication. So I think that it's okay to duplicate that. I know it's like super long and hard to read, but I do, I, I do find that I often end up pulling those out um, and reusing it. It's usually because another test needs like exactly the same input or it's like pretty much the same thing, but the name is different, something like that. So that's the only case where I would pull it out. But if it's just one, it's like a one-off thing and one test is using it, then I just leave it in the test. Um, hi, Christy. I have a couple questions. So the first one is when you um, mentioned the um, building, uh, you write your own unit test. I, I sometimes find that I had to use different libraries like APIs, Clango, API Machinery. So how can I make sure that um, the code that, or the unit test I write will um, um, com uh, compatible with the like the latest AppStream in those projects because they those codes change as well. So how how do I make sure that th something changes on the other repositories right. and my unit test won't get uh, affected mm -hmm. or like can, how can I control the effect? Uh, another question is um, for the end-to-end um, -end test that you just mentioned that I wonder that if. All we have to do is do um, when we uh, create the controller, we just have to monitor the uh, the add, update, and delete. If those things uh, work uh, correctly, uh, I can assume that the end-to-end -end test works uh, fine. Um, and last question, <laughs> uh, if I may, um, I think um, you mentioned that for the system test that um, we always um, the, the um, functions is more asynchronous. So uh, uh, resources created doesn't mean they actually exist, so you have to uh, pull them. So I wanted to get your um, uh, feedback on like pulling versus pushing using informers, because uh, for informers you actually just like wait to, to get the information rather than you, uh, for someone to give you the information rather than you go to get fetch the information. So just like uh, it works uh, uh, opposite directions. Uh, 
So just want to get all your um, opinions on all the questions I have just raised. <laughs> Thanks. Okay. So the first question I think was about how uh, the versions of the libraries that you're using might be changing out from under you, and you want to make sure that your code keeps working with those. Um, so I think that that's something that you definitely would probably not want to be covering with the unit test, because the unit test should hopefully be like mostly not aware of the libraries you're using. Like you're just passing in your objects, and they're like being like, is this is this valid? Or like, I need to like make a new object based on this, like that kind of thing. And that's why we still need the integration test and this and the system test. So I think the only thing you can really do is have all these unit tests and then have like a few system tests and integration tests. And then because you're probably vendoring in the code, you can uh, you know update it when you're ready and then like run all your system tests and integration tests and then those pass, you should be good. I mean, you'll never be 100% sure, no matter what you do. Um, and then for the second question, I think you were, you were asking about you're uh, being sure that your system tests, your end-to-end -end tests were working. I didn't quite. Uh... Sorry. Uh, yes. So if my controller um, is functional, like for example, I can add, update, and delete. Uh, those things works uh, perfectly. Can I assume that my uh, system test is done, or <laughs> are some other things I need to test? Oh, do you mean like what do you need to be testing in the actual system test itself? Yes, um, um, I think you gave a code snippet, but I'm not able to see the exact content. With, with like an update and a, yeah. and a delete. And a, yeah, I think that that's pretty good. In an older version of this uh, presentation, I recommended like one per type, like one test per controller and CRD sort of combo, which I think is pretty much fine and like mostly happy paths because you want to rely on your other uh, more fine-grained tests to test all of the edge cases that you might um, encounter. And uh, I think maybe for the third one, come up to me after it. We can keep, uh, keep okay, talking. Cool. <laughs> Uh, yeah, this is a, a great talk, um, and I definitely feel that way because uh, it helped me point out or pointed out to me a lot of the things I'm doing wrong with my testing. So that was very informative. I'm uh, sorry. <laughs> no, thank you. That's that's thank you very much. Uh, so the thing I wanted to know a little bit more, maybe you can provide uh, more of an example, is that the idea of the imperative shell and the functional core, um, and then what, sort of what it looks like when you're to you know how you decide what code goes into what layer there, and then also. With the imperative shell, do you do you still get any testing coverage of that, or are you okay with not testing that glue? Mm -hmm. So I think, um, like personally, I would be okay with almost not testing it at all. Like definitely not. Like if I would probably have something like an integration test or a system test that kind of generally makes sure that everything will run, uh, but then I wouldn't set out to explicitly test it. I think that the more you find yourself like refactoring things and putting logic into this functional core, you'll feel fine about not testing that because you realize it's just like calling out to something else and, and handling the error. And because we're dealing with Go, we can actually rely a lot on like the, the compiler to tell us when we've made a mistake there. Whereas in a language like Python, you really would want to make sure you covered every line because you may just have made a typo in the middle of it. Um, and then, uh, what was? did you have another question as well? Uh, just sort of like the example about you know how you decide what to put into the functional core and what goes at the imperative shell. I think that's pretty hard to do. Um, if you take a look at the example repo there, I have two versions of one of the same controller uh, where I've tried to factor out the code into like kind of a, kind of a functional core. Um, the controller is super simple though, so I don't know if it's a super compelling example, but you can kind of see like, I think pretty much just move everything out that you can. Just like keep moving stuff out until you can't really do it anymore. It's just making the code worse. And that's in that, uh, the Bobcat Fish Bobcat repo. Fish testing. Testing CRDs. Yeah. Awesome. Thank yeah. you very much. No problem. Thank you for the talk. Um, so could you share, like, in your experience uh, or your observation, uh, what's, how much time you spend on writing tests versus uh, you implement the, the CRD logic? Mm -hmm. um, because I, I feel like uh, for developers, mostly uh, more interesting implement the code versus uh, spend the major time writing tests. That is a great question. I really like that question. Uh, because I found over my career that it has definitely shifted. Like at the beginning of my career, I spent most of my time writing the logic itself. But what I do now mostly is I try to actually start with the documentation for what I'm writing. So I start with the documentation, and then from there I go into tests. And then by the time I'm actually writing the thing itself, it's really easy and fast to do. And the reason is that having to write the tests and having to write the documentation has forced me to think a lot about it. So I end up thinking a lot about like what is this interface that I'm writing? What should it actually take? What should it actually return? What is it going to be like to call it? And then by the time I get around to actually implementing the thing, I've like thought through a lot of it. I'm just like, and I'm done. And I move on to the next thing. So I would say it's actually quite a large percentage of my time writing these tests and then like sometimes rewriting them because I start and I, it turns out that it, 
I designed it poorly. Um, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Christy, for a very informative talk. I have a question. Uh, how do you like, uh, structure the test like we have three kind of tests like end-to-end -end, uh, integration and unit test. So how do you uh, and what's your recommendation on the way we structure the test? And for example, inside unit test, we have some code and can we like reuse those code for integration tests and end-to-end -end tests as well? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, so the question is about how you actually structure the code. Um, I think that test code is just like any other code. So if you feel like it's useful to factor some of it out and reuse it, then totally do that. And if you share it between all the test types, that's totally fine. Um, the other thing is that unit tests, I often find it useful to put them with the code they're testing. So there's like the, you know, the file that has the code, and then right next to that, there's the underscore test version that has the test in it. But Integration tests and system tests usually end up living somewhere else because they're more broad. So there's like a test directory or something that has the integration test, the system tests, and maybe the libraries that are being used by your unit tests as well. Uh, great. So thank you very much for uh, attending and for all the great questions. Thank you.